Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Meet the Author program. I am Jenny Levine with Durham County Library, and I am very pleased to introduce this evening's guests. This program is being recorded, and I will share the link to the recording with you in my newsletter. If you are not on that list, email me, and I will put my email in the chat and make sure you get it. And please, if you have questions for our speakers, do add them to the chat. Jeremy Payden was raised in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic. He is a poet, translator, and professor of Latin American literature at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. He's the author of three collections of poems. Among these, Ruina Montium, about the 2010 Chilean mine collapse, has been published in both English and Spanish. He's also the translator for various poets from Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Spain. He, and he is the author of the children's book, Under the Ocelot Sun. Also joining us is the illustrator of Under the Ocelot Sun, Annalisa Hermosilla, who is a Panamanian artist based in Northern Virginia. She graduated from Transylvania University in 2018 with a major in studio art and a minor in art history. I am going to share the link to the websites for each of them in the chat. I want to mention that a portion of the proceeds of the sale of the book will help support local Durham nonprofit, El Futuro. The book is also available at Durham County Library. And now please welcome Jeremy Payton and Annalisa Hermosilla. Thank you very much, um, Jenny, for the invitation. And thank you also to the Durham County Library for um, letting us come in through this virtual format to um, share about this book and, and share also Annalisa's wonderful artwork. Um, and, and answer questions that, that um, people might have. Um, one of the things to say before, before reading, this is a story about uh, a mother telling her daughter why they've left Honduras and have made the trek north and are sitting now at the, the border to cross into uh, the United States. And Migration and migration of this kind is, is one that, um, that's always been part of my own um, understanding of, of the world and understanding of the relationship between um, Central America and, and the US. I remember, I mean, we, we, when we moved to, to Nicaragua in the early 80s, this would have been right after the Sandinistas had taken over, and um, soon after we got there, the Contras began their um, their Contra revolutionary work. And in fact, we had good friends of the family um, who decided to leave Nicaragua and decided to uh, um, immigrate into the United States. And then in the in the mid eighties. Uh, ended up getting amnesty from the Reagan administration at that time. When we lived then in the Dominican Republic, there was also um, quite a history, or there has been quite a history of migration from the Dominican Republic to places like Boston and New York, um, so that you have a sizable community of, of Dominicans in uh, the American Northeast. Um, but this, this book responds to um, the migrant caravans of the last handful of years. Um, that also and are a crisis brought about by a number of, of causes. Among these, climate change. Among these, um, global trade relationships. Uh, among these, the drug war and also the um, aftermath of decades of, of civil war. Uh, and a lot of these civil wars have been proxy wars um, during the Cold War. All of that heavy stuff said, um, I, I'll, I'll start reading from the book. I, it is in both English and Spanish, and I will read some in both. 
Somos gente de maíz, mija. We are people of the corn, mija. Lo molemos en metates. Lo remojamos en cal. Lo trituramos hasta volverlo masa para las tortillas. En la mañana bebemos su leche tibia con cacao, vainilla y canela. We grind it on metates, soak it in cal, and grind it down the masa for tortillas. In the morning, we drink its milk warmed with cacao, vanilla, and canela. La gente de maíz hace su casa en el monte, decía la abuela, donde cantan el quetzal y el cotinga, donde brincan libres los ríos y riachuelos. People of the corn make their home in the forest, abuela would say, where quetzal and cotinga sing near rivers and streams that leap free. En la noche, el jaguar cuida su sueño. Cuando cuento historias del jaguar y el quetzal, te cuento cosas que la abuela me contaba de niña. At night, the jaguar guards their sleep. When I tell quetzal and jaguar stories, I tell you things abuela told me as a child. Porque tú y yo, mi hija, en, Te en Tegucigalpa nacimos. Because for you and I, mija, were born in Tegucigalpa, raised among the concrete and zinc of Tegus, we'd never seen a quetzal, or heard monkeys howl and hoot, or felt the swoop of a bat's wings until we fled the city north toward Guatemala and beyond. Abuela came from the mountains. She knew each tree by name. She told me the stories I tell you so I would know who I was and not fall in with the glue huffers who lose themselves in fumes after a day of selling oranges, rags, and street corner nothings. Abuela told of when families lived in mountain villages and maíz was grown in milpas with frijoles and tomates. This was before failed crops, late frosts, before floods and drugs drowned Tegus. And the story goes on and, and she recounts some of um, the history that I gave a brief uh, overview of to, to her daughter, um, a history of, of the 20th century in Honduras. And she reminds her also of, of family members of of her own that have gone uh, north to work in the United States and have been sent back uh, because part of the this relationship is one where workers will come and they will work for a while. Some will come back on their own because they have they miss home or because they have done what they they wanted to do. Many will come back because they they end up being deported. Um, but as, as the story moves forward, they move towards the border and she explains a thing or two to her daughter in this moment where she says, and hunger, a different hunger has led us here, a hunger for peace, for justice. Mija, those birds we'd never seen, the Quetzal and the Scarlet Macaw are a treasure protected by laws, and you are more precious than they. That's why we've pushed, pulled, carried you north through jungle heat, hidden you from guards on the hunt. That's why we've come. That's why we've crossed rivers, mountains, cities, and borders. And with that, I will turn things over to Anelisa. <clears throat> thank you, Jeremy. Um, thank you again, Durham County Library, for inviting us. Uh, it's really an honor to be here virtually um, and sharing about this beautiful story that Jeremy wrote. Um, I did put together a little slideshow uh, with some of my favorite images from the book. Uh, just to explain a little bit about the process and also about the imagery that I chose in conjunction with Jeremy's words, um, how we together brought these, this beautiful poem to life. <clears throat> so 
I just want to start with the with the cover. So when we had first started talking about illustrating this book, um, immediately I thought of vibrant colors, strong imagery, things that really catch your eye, just to things that um, make you think of the life and the beauty about Latin American cultures. And also <clears throat> taking into account that this is such a heavy story, but there is also an element of beauty. There is love to it. There is moments of happiness. So I thought that vibrant colors and very, um, very lively images were needed for such a heavy topic. Um, and so for the cover, the title of the book is Under the Ocelot Sun, which alludes to um, mythology, Mesoameric, Mesoamerican mythology, where uh, the world was created and destroyed and created again and destroyed. And one of those, in one of those creations, the, the god, the deity, I guess, was kind of like an ocelot. And then when he destroyed the world, he sent Jaguars, jaguars down to kind of consume the world and start anew. So we wanted to show that in the porch, in the in the like cover of the book, um, just to kind of remind us of that history and the connection to our legacy. And then also um, we have the main characters of the story. It's the mother and her daughter who are venturing north towards a better life and towards hope to, for, uh, like Jeremy said, for a better life and another chance and for work, for stability, security, all these different things that people migrate for that are very personal to them. So then this is another one of my favorites. Well, this is I think this one would be my favorite. Um, I just really like, it, it was one of the first ones I created. There's so much mention about corn, how we are people of the corn and this connection to corn, which is such a staple in Latin American cuisine. Regardless of where you go in Latin America, you will see some sort of variation of corn, whether it's tortillas or it's um, milk or it's, just corn on the cob or just different, different um, dishes that feature corn as their main source. It's just incredible. This, this food is just everywhere. And it's such a big connection to us that I, I think this is, it's a, it was important for me to include it. And I think Jeremy agrees with that. He really likes this image when I first showed him. Um, I also liked how this part was kind of going off the frame. Just visually, I think that's very appealing to me. Um, it also kind of in a symbolic way signifies that breaking out of the box, breaking out of the mold. Um, and I realized that through creating these images that I had started to put kind of a, a little border around, so kind of like a frame around each picture. And unconsciously I was breaking out of it. So I thought, I think that's a very symbolic, it's very symbolic of the poem. Uh, another element that Jeremy and I had talked about was using mixed media. Um, first, I had thought that the images needed to be clean, crisp, very well-defined pictures. And then he was the one who suggested actually maybe doing something a little bit more organic just like how the story progresses from, it's, it's not linear. If you'll read the, the story, it's not just one event after the other, the way that the mother explains to her daughter, her heritage, all the, the, different, um, the, the different wars that happen throughout Latin America, the reasons why they're migrating, uh, the different events that happen in the story are not one after the other. Everything is intertwined with one another. And I think that this kind of organic and very lyrical line really goes, it pairs well with the poem in that way. 
uh, this one is another one of my favorites because it's very personal. I remember, um, you know, cooking with my grandmother or with my mom, with my aunties, um, especially when you're young, you're helping, quote unquote, <laughs> but you're just there to kind of snack on all the things that they're making and drink a little bit of this, eat a little bit of that. So that's really, it, this is a very tender image that um, it, it provides kind of that personal connection to the poem. And also, um, you know, here's the, the corn again. It's that motif that is throughout the book that is such an important um, symbol in our cultures. Um, another thing that you'll notice too is that I used um, newsprint. So I took newspaper and specifically, I tried to look for articles that talked about immigration. That was deliberate. I couldn't find as many as I wanted. So there, are, there may be some words here and there that don't really have anything to do with a specific news about immigration. But I did um, search specifically for articles that, had, that made reference to immigration. And... Uh, just to add that note of relevance to the images, to keep it current. This one, uh, this one actually was the publisher's favorite. She ended up purchasing this image, which is such an honor to me that it has, you know, a, a physical home that somebody has it in their house, not just in the book, but it, the, the actual image. This one is very, magical and fantasy-like, which also provides a little bit of that tenderness that despite the heaviness of the book, there is this element of tenderness, of care. Um, there's this connection to nature throughout the book. Also um, kind of uh, when Jeremy was reading in, towards the beginning of the book, how he, he mentions that people grow amongst, they play and grow and, and live amongst the trees and the jungle and um, that they know each tree by name, that kind of thing. It's, it's such a, I think it's such a beautiful connection that he made there that I had to include it in the images, how, how the, the harmony, you know, between people and nature you know, throughout this story. <clears throat> uh, so this one is a depiction of kind of like a shanty town, which is very common in Latin America. You'll have cities and places that are super, super developed. And then right across the street, you'll have homes made of just concrete and zinc which is such an interesting contrast. Uh, I remember, you know, just living, I, I grew up in Panama City and just seeing skyscrapers, hotels, beautiful homes, and literally right down the street was just little shacks, basically. It's such, a, such an interesting thing to see that is very real. And I think people who live in these countries, so we, we who live in these countries, we're kind of numb to that uh, division because we see it every day, but maybe to an outsider, it might be a little bit more shocking how one side is so developed and the other is not. And I think including that in the book is also, was also very important to me because it is um, another factor that might contribute to why people would immigrate. It might be poverty, it might be climate change, it might be that they can't find a job or that there's not, they can't find food for their child or something. So that's why depicting the, a, a town like this was so important. Next, uh, we have the prison. This one is one of my favorites just because it touches on that element of art 
um, in the book, there is a part where the mom is talking about how artists took over an abandoned prison and transformed the walls into beautiful murals, kind of showing how from darkness, from this abandoned prison, something beautiful could come out. So I decided to depict uh, a Mesoamerican deity. Um, I just blanked out on the name, <laughs> um, but he's the kind of the deity of creativity and playfulness. And that's why I wanted to put him there just to kind of a nod to art and to beauty and games and color. And again, you can see the newsprint throughout the images, which keeps the reader present in this moment, that this was not forever ago. This is on the news currently. This other image, very emotionally charged. This was one that was a little bit difficult to illustrate, actually. Um, this one is depicting children uh, waiting kind of in a, like a, within a cyclone fence. It's alluding to the, the detention centers at the border. And honestly, it's really heartbreaking how these children have to wait hours, days, who knows how long uh, to be reunited with their family if they get reunited with them at all, you know? So I decided to title this one, The Timeless Room, because children really don't have that much of a grasp on time. So it could be, for them, this could be five minutes, it could be hours, they could feel like a whole year. You never know what it feels like to them. And so I wanted to depict the main character, our little girl. Um, she's breaking the fourth wall, looking at the reader to kind of pull you in and like, see where I am, you know, it's kind of her being like, why am I here? Where am I? You know, first of all, can you explain to me why I'm here? Where's my mom? All these different things that are so heavy, but they're very true and very real. <clears throat> and then finally, this, I, I think this is the last image, <laughs> um, but finally, um, it, we have our little girl reunited with her mom and they've made it kind of across the border and are looking for a new life. They're, you know, giving, they're, they're given a chance, hopefully, to start anew and to be together. So here we have, again, the, the corn motif, we have the frame, and they are within the frame, but that kind of gave me, like, when I was creating this image, this frame gave me a little sense of security, I think. And that's why I didn't break out of it because the, this corn frame kind of that I made um, is a little like safe haven for them, you know, within there's all these bad things have happened and all these, all the struggle and the trials and tribulations that they've been through, but there's, this home, there's the corn, they are people of the corn, they are together and they've made it. And in the background, you can see a little bit of a city, you can see the caravan, the mountains, you know, it's, it's just all tying it back into the story. And that is all I have. <laughs> the rest of the images, you'll have to see for yourself. <laughs> I love them. I love the images um, and the story. And I was taking some notes as you guys were speaking because um, it's a very moving story and stunning images, it's hard to describe. Um, but when we hear stories of people at the border and I feel like this book really helps to humanize them, um, makes them seen um, as a culture, we look at the border situation and feel helpless um, and what can we do and um, we get stuck there. Uh, so this was a wonderful um, 
tool is not the right word, vehicle for um, and the way you used words, the newspapers to, you know, it, it's not just a story, it's, it's constantly ongoing. Um, and the way you described um, the cities sounded a little bit like parts of Durham where I live, where there is um, some desperate poverty right up against, you know, very wealthy uh, neighborhoods, even on my street, it goes, you know, you know, rental, 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 you know, and then the next block is the nice, nice section. Um, I know it's a, a different culture and a different world, but it it's, um, makes the, the book is, makes the story very relatable to all of us. Um, so the questions I came up with, um, and thank you, yeah, Zochi Pili, I'm going to, yes. is that close? Yes, <laughs> yes, that's the name of the deity of uh, playfulness and games and arts and all that, Zochi Pili. <laughs> So, so many questions. I'll try to keep it to just a few. Um, one was, where do these images live? Like, how big are they? And you said one was sold. Um, how do you make them? And then they get into this book. Yes. So the images are all on 11 by 14. So they're not that big, but they are definitely action packed. <laughs> um, so Normally, I work on traditional media, so pen, paper, watercolor, collage, and then I scan them in high resolution, and that's how they end up in the book. I, we work with a book designer to, you know, kind of place them in different areas throughout the book. You make it sound so easy, but there's so much detail. <laughs> there's so much detail. It sounds easy, but it took a while. <laughs> sure. <laughs> they take forever. <laughs> So another question I had was, how did the two of you meet and decide to work together? Well, she's, she, there was, I mean, so I teach at Transylvania University, um, which is a rather far bit away from Panama City. Um, a bit. But there was... I mean, you and one other uh, Panamanian student and an art student also ended up at ended up at Transy, um, which is what we call Transylvania for short. <laughs> um, and while Annalisa and I never, I mean, she never had a class with me. Um, we knew each other, and we would always speak to each other. Um, and I would always speak to her in Spanish, and so she'd always speak to me in Spanish, and, um, in 2016, right, is when Maria came through, uh, and destroyed a good bit of Puerto Rico, unless that was 2015, um, and, as a response to that, so my my um, my mother's Can I have your attention, please. Uh, my mother my mother's Puerto Rican, and um, as a response to to Hurricane Maria, I wrote a poem and I asked her to illustrate it so that we could put together a broadside and have uh, a fundraising event for um, for hurricane relief. So we, we did that and raised somewhere on the order of twelve to $1,300 that we were then able to send to Techo. And Techo is um, like Habitat for Humanity, but it's um, a Latin American organization run in Latin America by Latin Americans. And they were already on the ground there in, in Puerto Rico doing quite a bit of work. So we were able to send that money to them. And um, when our publisher, Shadeland House Modern Press, and I started talking about this book um, and, and wanting it to be an illustrated book, I the first person I suggested as a possibility was Annelisa, who at that time had just graduated from college and was uh, making her way through um, an assortment of, of 
the kinds of jobs that you do when you're wanting to have free you're time. Fresh, when you're fresh out of college. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I'm sure you're still engaged in. Um, well, not, not have a great job in, in marketing oh. and branding. Oh, excelente. <laughs> um, so I, I suggested on Elisa as, as, as a person, one, because we had worked together, two, because I think her images are fabulous, and three, because I thought she would really understand the story and understand how to represent the story visually, her, being herself from, from Panama, knowing uh, Central American culture as well as she does and it being part of her own heritage. I thought that that would be the best thing. And thankfully they, they said, we'll take, we'll, we'll, we'll trust you. And so she and I started collaborating. That's wonderful. And, and you, I mean, when you took this even further, um, there's a, um, a teaching guide. I'm going to put this in the chat too. Um, for you developed for teachers. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, the, I mean, one of the difficulties I think with, with a topic like this is on the one hand, we want, we want to respond um, because we see we see the humanitarian crisis, but we don't know enough about it and we don't know how to respond. And um, we don't know how then to talk to, to our children about it who may or may not also, you know, be paying attention because they see it on the news or they hear us talking about it. So um, since this is something that was, that is, geared towards children, even though it's heavy or has some heavy topics, um, I thought really that, that possibly the best way to, to sort of help engender that kind of a conver conversation was providing a guide that would, that would um, be able to give um, teachers or parents who want to read the book with their children um, all kinds of background information on it, and also um, questions and activities to engage with the story um, so that children through these activities can, can come to a better understanding of, of what's going on. Tremendous. Um, really takes it to the next level and kids deal with hard things all the time and having something to help them, I think it's pretty great. Um, I wanted to ask you all, I got to hear a little bit about the next project that you're working on. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, uh, at the moment though, it is still, we're still just writing. Um, um, still, I mean, given how, how much, um, Central America, Nicaragua, Panama, Costa Rica are um, part of our heritage. Um, and given how Central America is this connection between South America and North America, and given that one of the ways to understand though there are many, one of the ways to understand the migrant crisis right now is also a manifestation of the climate crisis. And um, another way to think and uh, about the climate crisis is as um, an extinction crisis among, among animals, especially animals in threatened regions. Um, because I like to do happy things. <laughs> um, I, we got to talking about the possibility of doing um, an ABC bestiary that, uh, that looks at especially Central American animals and um, that follow 
that look at ways in which these animals connect both um, Anglo America and Latin America, and the way these animals have responded to or are responding to the the climate crisis, and how these animals don't um, don't understand borders. So, for example, um, one of the animals um, is going to be the porcupine. And the American porcupine is a South American animal that, that um, evolved in South America. But once a land bridge, the land bridge of, of Central America was established between the two land masses, the porcupine migrated north. And now the porcupine that is uh, known as the Canadian porcupine, which is the porcupine that, that most um, North Americans understand, is actually has its roots in, um, in South America. Or you have birds like the cerulean warbler, which is a tiny little beautiful uh, blue bird that summers in the eastern mountains of Appalachia and some of your Ohio and Illinois kind of forests in winters in the um, northern Andes of Colombia and Venezuela, right? So we have we have migratory birds that that come back and forth who are threatened on both sides uh, due to deforestation and on both in the Andes and in uh, the northern hemisphere. So it's a it's a book that's that's gonna hopefully have a lot of interesting little facts about these animals. Facts, some of them will be scientific, some of them will be mythological uh, because of the importance that, that these animals play in, um, in just the way that we understand the world, whether it's in science, whether it's in religion, whether it's in um, our daily life. Wow, Annalisa, it sounds like you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the more, honestly, the more I understand the story, the more I hear Jeremy talk about it, the more excited I get because I like to draw. <laughs> so the more material I have, I just eat it up. <laughs> of course. And you, those images, are they starting to come together for you? Or are you uh... mm, since we're still kind of in the early stages of writing, not quite, but I definitely have kind of these vague kind of pops of color more so you know they still look very like abstract shapes <laughs> but just kind of the initial initial thoughts of what colors I'm liking with paired with words you know kind of like that. Well I cannot wait to see what you guys do next and I always like to ask my last question is what artists and writers do you enjoy and support and think we should know about um, if there are any in your circle or you know in the past um, anyone that you want to mention <laughs> I should have uh, well, <laughs> should have emailed you that question <laughs> no I mean I think for for one one poet whom I think more um, English speakers should know about, one Latin American poet whom I think more English speakers should know about is Gabriela Mistral. Uh, people, people really, I guess, who know a little bit about poetry know her um, compatriot, Pablo Neruda, uh, right? There are movies about him and, and everybody knows that he won the Nobel Prize, but Gabriela Mistral was actually the first Latin American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, and she was also um, a fierce advocate for education. She was a, she was a teacher and um, really a, a fine, fine poet. Um, so she would be one that I would, um, that I would recommend. Um, another, um, in terms of 
a tough question because there's so many categories. You know? like, <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> if you can only pick one, no, I, I don't like that question. I like to do like top 10, you know, or. <laughs> right. Um, so let me look around in my. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about my, one of mine because um, Jeremy and I spoke a little bit about Valeria Luiselli. Oh, yeah. And what um, just a revelation her writing is. And, and I. I can barely speak about it. It's kind of overwhelming, um, just unusual and creative and deep and um, endless. Uh, really enjoy her work. Annalisa, did you want to mention an artist? Um, well, definitely one that inspired uh, some of the images uh, is an author, Isabel Allende. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever heard of her, um, but one of her books that I had to read back when I was in middle school, I think it was early, early high school, um, was City of Beasts. And that one really inspired the, the jaguar picture that I drew. Um, uh, she's one of, uh, she's a really good author and definitely my favorite, one of my favorites, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. There's a lot of books by him that are just absolutely beautiful. And in terms of visual artists, the, there's this artist that I follow on Instagram. Her name is Andy Soto. She's from Panama. Um, her work is absolutely incredible. It's very, very magical. And she has a very distinct style also. So my, my goal is to be like her. <laughs> Honestly. Say her name again. Say her name again. Andy Soto. Andy Soto. Thank you. And in terms of other poets... I mean, one that is, one who's a contemporary poet and is part of a, I mean, there are a number now who um, are Latinx poets that write in English. Um, and one of these is uh, Javier Zamora. Uh, that is with Javier with a J and Zamora with a Z. Z-A-M-O-R-A, -A. and he's an El Salvadoran poet, and his, uh, one of his books was, was unaccompanied, and it, and it deals with a number of, of those um, children who have, who have come unaccompanied and crossed the border unaccompanied, uh, and in that vein, two, um, Two writers, they're not poets, they're prose writers, they're essay writers and novelists that I think um, are really worthwhile in terms of reading to understand what the Latinx experience is. Um, um, Hector Tobar, Hector Tobar, um, and he wrote a collection of essays in the early 2000s called Translation Nation that really kind of looks at um, this relationship between Anglo and Latin America as it relates to Latin Americans living in the U.S. and the transformation of, of American uh, as an Anglo-American culture because of the Latin Americanization of the U.S. Um, he's, he, so he's one, and the other one would be Luis Alberto Urrea, uh, he has a book called um, The Devil's Highway is one of his nonfiction books, but, but he, he, before The Devil's Highway, which won a number of awards, there were a handful of other nonfiction books, um, and he's also got a number of really fine novels that kind of deal with this topic. Um, in, in and around, though, North Carolina, I want to say Paul Cuadros, is that his name, who wrote the, the At Home on the Field, the story about, I, I want to say it's set in Siler City. Yep, um, soccer in Siler City, right? Yeah, his, his was, was a really good book that, that, you know, for those in Durham who haven't read it, it would be a good thing to read. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the uh, recommendations and for your time and um, sharing your talent with the world. Uh, I'm excited about Under the Ocelot Sun and having it here in the library. 
and people I hope will read it and check it out and I look forward to seeing what you all do next. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.